Nation Church, 11032 South Indiana, where Reverend Andrew D. Hunt Jr. is our leader. Look, don't touch that down. Stay tuned. Channel 36, Can TV. You can restream us, Transformation Church Chicago. You can YouTube us, Sean David Cohen, or Transformation Church. Don't touch that down. Stay tuned. Enjoy the program already in progress. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a word from the Lord today in the gospel according to John. Fourth chapter, verses 19 through 26. When you found it, won't you stand? John 14, 19 through 26. I'm sorry, John 4, 19 through 26. John 4, 19 through 26. And as our custom, won't you hold your Bibles high and repeat after me. This is the Word of God. It has transformative power. I will, I will praise God for this preaching moment. This preaching moment. And, I and I declare that after this moment, after this moment and I shall never, I shall never ever, ever be the same. Be the same. In John 14, 19, I'm sorry, 4, 19 through 26. Maybe I'll preach about 14 next week. Must be a reason. John 4, 19 through 26. These words are faithfully recorded. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as those to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Edification of our hearts and our souls. Amen. You may be seated. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I'm going to talk today for a few moments from the subject transformative worship. Transformative worship. The true worship will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. It's fallen fresh on these, this place. We thank you for these, your people, who press their way to yet again come into the house of the Lord. Lord, we ask that the word touch the words of my mouth. Let them not be my own understanding, nor my opinion. But Lord, let them fall fresh from you. That someone may be transformed by the renewing of their mind. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
transformative worship. My prayer, I have many prayers for this church, but my, one of my singular, most poignant prayers for this church is that we be a worshiping church. My prayer, when I, before I close my eyes, is that each of you experiences God in a majestic way. Each of you finds a place where you and only God can dwell. Um, that we be a place of worship, a place of free worship, where people can come in here willing to lift their hands in praise. People can feel free to cry in the pews. People can feel free to dance in the aisles if they should so desire to do so under the unction of the Spirit. That we understand that at the very core of who we are as creations of God is that we have to be and should be Worshippers. But worship has been minimized to solely an emotional experience. But real worship is more than an emotional experience. Real worship becomes the fiber of your being. Real worship acknowledges the presence of God. My colleagues in ministry may not like this comment, but it grieves my heart to have so much dancing on Sunday morning, but outlined by killing that will occur Monday through Saturday. It grieves my heart to be so in tune and want to have an emotional experience on Sunday morning, but still the literacy rate in our community being on the rise that's because worship is more than just an emotional experience, but it is an invitation to the very presence of God. When the presence of God is there, violence goes down. When the presence of God is there, the disenfranchised are pulled up by their bootstraps. When real worship takes place, the presence of God will be felt. So if anybody asks you, what is the church? Some may ask, is that church a Pentecostal church? Is that church a Church of Christ church? Is that church a full gospel church? Is that church a Baptist church? I want you to tell them, I, I don't know about any of that, but we're a worshiping church. And we're a worshiping church that believes and leads and depends on God. So if you have decided to call that worship Pentecostal, let it be. If you decide to call it full gospel, let it be. But no matter what it is, we worship God in spirit and in truth. What makes worship worship is that worship must first be, in order to be poignant and powerful, Worship has to be prompted by a reflection of God's attributes. See, too many of us worship but for our attributes. What are our attributes? What we got. So if God does something for us, we, we hallelujah, we lift in our hands in praise, we running around. If I got a new car, we sprinting out the door. But no, real worship is about God's attributes. Real worship does not call us into what God has done, but real worship calls us in the space of who God is. Uh, we worship God because we understand that there would not be a sun to shine in the sky had it not been for God. We worship God. Whether we get money in our pockets or not, we worship God. Because last night when the moon set, it was God himself that put the stars in the sky and the moon to shine by night. We worship God. But for no matter what our calamities may be, whether we rise out of them or not, we worship God. Because on God's divine finger, he puts the axis of the world so the world can rotate, acknowledging the doors of the new day. So when I 
think about the magnificence of God, I can't help but stop in my tracks and kneel down to my knees for the power of a God who's got the whole world in his hand. I worship him. Because if he's never done anything else, he's done enough. I worship him. Because he's given me the activity of my limbs. He's given me the power. Genesis tells me if it wasn't for him, nothing would be made that was made. That's gangster, ain't it? Nothing would exist. That's why I worship him. Because nothing would exist if it had not been for the presence and the power of God. We worship God for his attributes. See, when you understand when you believe in your heart that God's got a hold of your situation, then you don't hesitate to get up and go to church on Sunday. When the truth, when the truth, when the truth really rests in you, that there is a God that controls everything. We worship Him. Because the only thing he needs to say is, I am that I am. He's that I am. And so we worship him because he's worthy to be worshipped. You got up this morning. You came into this place to worship God. Uh, you, you, I hope you didn't come here to see Pastor Hunt. I could have been sick. I could have been on vacation. But, but we come to worship him because of who he is. That's real worship. How many of us come to worship looking for something? Real worship just acknowledges who he is and lets God handle the rest. Jesus in this text this morning describes what I would call authentic worship. What I would suggest to you today is the worship that we want to strive to as Transformations Church towards transformative worship. Worship that acknowledges God's attributes. So when we read this text this morning and go home and read John the fourth chapter all to yourself, when you get to the 19th through the 26th verse, it appears that this, these entire seven verses come out of nowhere. Jesus is having a discussion with the infamous woman at the way. Uh, Y'all remember the woman that had the five husbands and the one she was with wasn't her husband? Uh, he, he's having a discussion uh, at Jacob's well with this woman at the way. And somehow around after their discussions, around this 19th, the 26th verse, Jesus suddenly, seemingly, from a literary perspective, breaks in and says, those who worship the Lord worship him in spirit and in truth. I read it over and over again. And I tried to figure out what does this have to do with anything. But then I investigated. I investigated first who Jesus was talking to. And see, the woman at the well was a Samaritan woman. And the woman at the well was one from the least side of town. You know the place where they don't, the police are called and they don't come on time? And the least part of town. You know the part of town where their babies are getting slain in the street? And the least part of town, the town where the grocery stores don't want to be, that's where the Samaritan people were. They were in fact of Jewish heritage, but they were the least of the Jewish heritage. They were the ones that weren't allowed in the fancy Jerusalem and set up their own place after the exile of Israel. They found it. Does it sound like somebody? They found themselves on the outside of faith. But Jesus yet takes time to talk to this woman that is on the outside of faith. 
In fact, if you go and read scripture, even more poignantly, there were instances where the Samaritans would keep Jesus out of town because of the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. But when I kept on reading and reflecting on the position of the woman at the well, it dawned on me that what is happening in 19 through 26 is not an obscure passage where Jesus just steps out of some emotional will to say worship is worship in spirit and truth. But what Jesus is showing to us is that all of the verses that precede verse 19 are examples of true worship. They are guidelines, if you will, where we can draw our truth when we can find what real worship is. The first thing that we learned about worship. Jesus is on his way from Galilee to Jerusalem. And scripture says that he had to stop by Samaria. That meant that Samaria was on the way. He finds himself at Jacob's well. This is where he finds the woman at the way. And so the first step of worshiping in spirit and truth, the first step of transformative worship that I want you to take with you today is that God will meet you where you are. It didn't, the scripture didn't say that God said he had to go to Jerusalem to give a sermon to all the people that already knew what he might be talking about. But it said that God, that Jesus went out of his way. He went to an unpopular place and there he found the woman at the way. And I'm glad today that God would go to an unpopular place just to see about me. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? God will go to the sick room just to see about me. God will go to the south side just to see about me. God will meet you where you are. He'll meet you where you are. So when you get ready to worship, there are no excuses. Don't give excuses. I'm not good enough to worship. No, God, God wants to meet you exactly where you are. He made a special assignment when he woke you up this morning to say you are good enough. You are valuable enough to sit in Not only will he meet you where you are, but he'll give you something to do. And what he'll give you to do will be within your capabilities. See, many of us don't understand, worship is also our service to God. So if you're just coming to church on Sunday, raising your hand and hopping around, you ain't really worshiping. I'm sorry. is the exercise of service to God. What are you doing beyond Sunday morning? Right. Look what Jesus does. Look what Jesus does. He tells her, give me a drink. Not the drink y'all talking about. Water drink. She's out the way. He says, give me a drink. This worship has called her into an exercise of service. But look what, he, look what he does. He never puts any more on us than we can bear, and he asks us to do what is in our capability. He, she's standing out of well. She ought to be able to give him something to drink. I'm glad God's not like people. Jesus didn't walk up to her and say, give me a dissertation on the goodness of the Lord. He didn't walk up to her and say, give me one of your profound prayers that lift up the name of God. He asked her to do a simple thing that was within her capabilities. Give me a drink. And give me a drink because you act well. And I want you to know that to worship God does not require any huge thing on your part. Just do whatever God has given you to do. If God has it, I like what the old folks used to say about worship. The old folks used to say, if I don't have a hand, I'll pat my feet. If I don't have feet, I'll clap my hands. If I don't have hands and I don't have feet, I'll pat my hands. I'll give God what he deserves. I don't have to do anything. 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 I
to worship him within your capabilities. So there's no excuse for anybody under the sun not to worship God. Second thing. Worship knows no walls. True worship. Transformative worship. Knows no walls. What do you say? I want you to go on and read. See, this is another thing Jesus does. It seems like initially she wants to kind of argue. I tell you all the time, stop arguing with folks. Arguing doesn't get you anywhere. People gonna be who they gonna be. I have to learn that. They gonna be who they gonna be. They gonna do what they want to do. And so she wants to argue with him. She, she says to him, but you say the only place to worship is Jerusalem. See, the reason why she's saying that is the Samaritans have built their own temple in Samaria. And so there was a division of whose temple is the best temple. Well, oh, this show sounds like today. She wants to argue about what the best is, but Jesus doesn't argue. Um, Jesus just says, well, I'll tell you what. I'm that there will come a time where neither on this mountain or Jerusalem will any of this stuff matter. But what matters is that worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. And so in order to be good worshipers, in order to be transformative worshipers, we have to understand that worship occurs outside of walls. See, our worship is not transformative because we don't feel, we feel we can only worship if we come into the church. Right? We want to come in here and worship it. And we are required to be two or more gathered in his name, but real worship occurs outside of the walls. A real worship occurs in every aspect of of your life. In every aspect of your life, you give God the glory and the honor. In every aspect, because what happens in worship? In worship, you sacrifice. You give up you to acknowledge the presence of the Holy. And so you can't have transformative worship just coming into the house of the Lord, waiting for Coleman to play your favorite song, or me to preach your favorite sermon. Worship is an outside of world's experience. Amen. When you really worship, you give your, you give your kids to God. That's worship. Because you know God is bigger than you. You know it ain't about you. You give your children to God. Uh, you ask God to make a way for you to make a way for them. That's worship. Uh, uh, when, you, when you worship, when you worship God, when you see things that are happening down the road that might not be right, you step in because you know that you are worshiping God by offering them to God. When you worship God, when you worship God with your children, you understand that you got to give them to God first before you give them to their schools. You got to give them to God first before you give them to their soccer team. You got to give to God first before you give to their planes or their fans. You got to say, God comes first. You got to give to God. Do you worship? They ought to see that you love God. They ought to see that you intent on God. That's worship. Worship can't just occur in the four walls. Worship's got to occur at home. Worship's got to occur in your shower. Worship ought to occur in your dining room. You ought to think about the goodness and every now and then can't help yourself. <laughs> worship ought to occur at work. Ought to occur at work. You get ready to fly off the handle. When you get ready to do something that's not of God, because you know that God is so great, because you know that the I am He is everywhere, all the time. Yes, you might be mad, but there ought to be something in you out of a worship to Him that says, I will hold my peace. I'll let the Lord fight my battles for the victory shall be mine. There ought to be something 
something about their life. And so we gotta worship God in our places of employment. And then we have to we have to worship God. Oh, this is tough to do. We gotta worship God in every step that we take. Y'all remember that Paul and old song, every step I take, every move I make, right? I'll be watching you. That's kind of how God is. He's watching you. So we worship God in our actions of who we are, who we represent. We got to worship him. There's just, there's just certain stuff we can't get caught ourselves in. We can help him. We got to worship God. We got to walk in a different state than everybody else. Isn't that what we tell our children? Uh, when our children say, uh, well, everybody else is doing it, what do we say? Well, you ain't everybody else, but I want to check the parents today. But God is telling us, when we say we want to be like everybody else, we want to do like everybody else, God is saying, you ain't everybody else. <laughs> See, the same principle is a pride. When you, when you really love the Lord, when you're really on the Lord's side, then you got a certain kind of responsibility to worship God by your actions. You can't wear what everybody else got on. You can't go where everybody else go. You can't sit what everybody else is sitting. You can't be found in the same alleys that everybody else is found in. You got to worship God with your being. That don't mean don't have a good time. But you got to know who you are. Watch this, watch this. And when you're worshiping right, worshipers breed worship. If you find yourself in a situation where ain't nobody going to church, that's a problem. Don't nobody know the Lord? That's a problem. And you got to be careful because you have to worship God and understand when transformative worship is working. Wor worshipers breathe worship. Don't mean you don't come across people with problems. But the mentality breeds the mentality. And we're about to talk about that in a minute. And the reason is because this is a spiritual affair. Spirits draw spirits. Lost spirits gonna draw lost spirits. Chaotic spirits are gonna draw chaotic spirits. Loneliness spirits are gonna draw loneliness spirits. And you can be in a good spirit, but compromise your spirit because you're not worshiping God. Check around. Check around. If everybody around you is crazy, you crazy too. It ain't just them. If, if everybody you talking about is talking about brokenness in their life, brokenness in their relationship, you better be careful. Yours is about to break. Spirits. Breathe. See, I don't think this church thing is a game. This ain't no game. This spiritual thing ain't no game. You can't just shout hallelujah and pump and jump. Have it on Tuesday. endeavor. See, sometimes we get so involved in the emotion. I love the emotions that come with the black church. But sometimes we get so involved in the emotions we forget about the divine consciousness of the spirit. This ain't, this, this isn't something that just moves, make you jump up and down. No, this is something that works in your mind. And so transformative worship may give you an emotional experience here on Sunday. And we love emotional experiences. But after the emotional experience, the spirit ought to rest in your heart and mind. You ought to make some decisions today that you didn't make yesterday. If you're making the same decisions today that you made yesterday, then you have not moved into transformative worship.
person. You are knocking on the door. Look at your neighbor and say, you're knocking on the door. If you're here today, you're knocking on the door. Well, what is worship? God is spirit. If we're going to connect with that spirit, we got to get our spirit together. We got to get our spirit and climb with God. Are we willing today to give God all that we have? Are we willing to really worship him? Worship is happening on the highway. Worship might save your life on the damn line. When that person cuts you off, you won't drive by them and give them the bird, roll down your window and yell at them and they got a semi-automatic in their car. When you worship, you keep your peace. And you thank God for helping you get past that situation. And God will keep you as an advantage to worship. Lastly, Worship is the transition between two teams. Worship is the transition between two teams. Worship is the transition between truth and transformation. Worship calls you to tell the truth about yourself. People in the 12-step programs with an alcohol, drug addiction, what's the first thing they have to do? I know AJ knows this. What do they got to do, AJ? They got to tell the truth. They got to stop talking about what their mama did, what they could have had, and I could have been, no, 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 you ain't. Can I just, I don't talk like a Republican today, Brother Tillman. If you ain't nothing, it's because of you. Not because your mama. Not because your daddy, not because that's, that's what, a lot of people came from that same situation and did well. There's something else going on. And that's because worship got to occur through the two T's, truth and then transformation. What did this lady do? What did this lady do? Jesus checks her, go on and read it for yourself. Jesus checks her. She says, Jesus, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, yes, you're right. Um, you don't have a husband. In fact, you had five husbands. And the one that's down the street with you somewhere, that ain't your husband either. But I like what the woman at the well does. She didn't do like some of us. She didn't give an excuse. See, some sisters would have given an excuse. Well, you know, Jesus, there's no good men in Chicago. There's nobody that you can count on. Baby, that ain't the problem. You the problem. There's nothing good that I can find. I, I just can't seem to find my way. And this dude that you talking about, Jesus, down the street, he's just the best that I got. But I'm glad she didn't do that. She accepted the truth about her situation. She accepted I'm not in the favor of God. She accepted I'm not what God has called me to be. Does anybody here have that testimony? If you don't have that testimony, I'll have that testimony. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not where I want to be. And so God, I lay before you and tell you the truth. But I declare you can look beyond my thoughts. And I know that you're going to see my feet. Transformation. I want you to know that the truth is that you're hateful. Say, God, I'm hateful, but I'm ready.
next moment to worship lets us know that God will meet us where we are. Transformative worship. Says I worship him in the bathroom. I worship him in the church house. God changed the well. Jacob's well into a sanctuary. God will change your situation and turn your situation around. The third thing, to know your worship is not an emotional matter, but your worship is a spiritual matter. That spirits breathe spirits. That you have to breathe a spirit of positivity. You want to breathe a spirit of Christ. You want to be around folks that love the Lord more than you love the Lord. And finally, finally, truth. Will you tell the truth? Truth brings about transformation. So the scriptures tell us that the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming and he will come and proclaim all things to us. Jesus said, I am he. But I want you to go home and read a little while alone. I want you to read about the goodness of the Lord. For I am he is not where she stopped. But it seems like when she spoke the truth, anybody here willing to speak the truth about herself and her shortcomings, when she really found herself in the presence of God, in the presence of the whole, the scriptures tell us a few verses later that she went into the city and she told everyone that she could meet. Come see a man that has told me everything about myself.
worship Him every day, every hour. Our existence is depends on the truth of God. Let us lift our hands in this place today. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We invite transformative worship in this place. Not the regular worship that many of us grew up thinking was worship. Lord, we want more than an emotional experience. We want an emotional experience coupled with life practicality of worship. We not only want to have church better, we want to live better. Lord, we give our children to you today. We worship you with our children. Knowing that you are the greater example to them than we are. We worship you, God, and we give you our relationships today. That you guide them, that you enter our thoughts in the decisions that we make. We worship you today. We ask that you put discernment in our hearts. Let us tell the truth about ourselves. Let us look around. And if we look around ourselves and see brokenness, God, we're stepping out of brokenness today. Broken people, lost people. We give you the glory and the honor. We're not here to put on a show, God. We want to worship you for who you are. Transform us. Move in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for giving us second, third, fourth, five, six chances, God. To get it right. We thank you, God. Give this place, this house of spirit of worship. May people look at us and say, what must I do to be saved? May the experience in this place be transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, amen. Doors of the church are open. Doors of the church are open. You may be seated.
thing about myself. But just keep on. Find truth in your worship. Worship in the spirit and in truth. Take this shout on the car ride tomorrow. I dare to try it. I try it sometimes. Riding to the train station. I'm saying to myself, when I think about Jesus and all he's done for me on the train, I'm it looked like I'm asleep. I'm not asleep. I'm praying. My eyes is closed. I'm worshiping him. I'm, I'm thanking him for having me a place to go to. Worship him in spirit and in truth. And your worship becomes greater when you're worshiping God for his attributes. You're not worshiping because you like the folks you sit next to. Because you done, hallelujah, had your breakthrough. Let me tell you, you have a breakthrough one day and a breakdown tomorrow. So you can't worship God based on that. I'm a witness about that. But you worship him. Because he gives you your breakthroughs and he guides you through your breakdowns. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let's give God some praise. We come every first Sunday. It looks on the surface that we come worshiping him for what he did. We commemorate what Christ did. But we're worshiping his attribute. God's attribute of love. That's why we worship him. Because he loved us. How much did he love us? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We worship him because he loves us and he cares for us. And on that night, Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body, body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, take it and divide it among yourselves. After the same manner, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it and said, this is my blood, blood of the new covenant, take it and divide it among yourselves. At this time, you may assemble on the outer eyes as we partake in the Lord's Supper. For he loves us so much that he looks beyond our faults and sees our every day.
For those of you that may have missed our offertory period, the ushers will have offering baskets at the door on their way out. Let's go out today on the great hymn of the church. One day when I was lost, I was lost. 